Welcome to the SPA Bowie Lecture of the year. This is a, the Bowie Lecture is a sequence of three different lectures corresponding to the three sections of the Space Physics and Aeronomy section of the AGU. Uh, we have the Parker Lecture uh, today, uh, which is solar heliospheric. We have the Van Allen Lecture, uh, the SM, and we also have the Nicolay Lecture that is SA. But again, we're back in our rotation to the Parker Lecture, and today we're going to ha uh, take a voyage through the heliosphere with our distinguished lecturer, Dr. Len Berlaga. I wanted to say a few words about uh, Len. If I can find uh, the proper key, enter. Uh, here's a picture of Len uh, a few years ago. I think, was this at the University of Minnesota or just a little bit after that? Uh, he's an astrophysicist in the heliophysics division of NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center. He's been a co-investigator uh, uh, on, uh, on a variety of instruments, but he's worked with the magnetic field data Voyager. And as you know, it started out here at Earth at 1 AU and went to 120 AU, and it's still working. So it's a marvelous voyage uh, of exploration. He's been on a lot of uh, advisory committees and so on. He's served in a number of different roles, as you can see here. Cosmic Ray Section, Chairman of the Solar Wind and Interplanetary Magnetic Field Division, and so on. You can see his research interests below his picture here. Uh, heliospheric plasmas and magnetic fields, cosmic rays, planet-comet interactions, interstellar medium interactions, and so on. Well, at the university we always look up the citation index, and <laughs> I found that he has a marvelous publication record, and of course we knew that anyway. We wouldn't have invited him if he hadn't, but over 275 published papers, a very high citation rate, as you see in here, almost 700 uh, citations per year to this work that he's been doing on the solar wind, and a high Hirsch index. Uh, so very distinguished indeed. Uh, he, last year, won an award that I'm not sure very many of you know about, the Arktoski Award uh, or Medal. And it, uh, it's a very unusual medal, and I think the interesting thing is that you see down here, uh, it, can, it is a prize to the individual of $20,000 and a prize to an institution of your choice of $60,000. Now, if you don't know who Arktoski is, he's the uh, Belgian uh, Antarctic explorer that did the first overwintering in Antarctica. Um, Len tells me that uh, he's read the history and it's a very interesting individual who made a number of, study, of interesting discoveries. Well, here is the beginning uh, and the bottom line of what this lecture is going to be. As the solar wind expands outward, the radial component falls off in strength as 1 over r squared. The azimuthal is 1 over r. So you think that you might be able to predict the magnetic field strength. But Parker theory is a little more complicated. Uh, it all, the uh, observed field that's predicted uh, is uh, dependent on the total magnetic field. It depends on the solar cycle. It's dependent on the speed of the solar wind. It depends on the solar cycle. So if you'll look at this particular diagram, you'll see the, uh, the black squares from Voyager, and you'll see the solid line from Parker theory. So that brings us then into our lecture today, the, uh, this tour through the uh, heliosphere and the relation of the observations to the Parker theory. So let me bring up uh, Len's presentation. Come on. So here we are. Well, it's a, a real pleasure for me to have this opportunity to present the Parker Lecture. Parker was a hero of mine when I was young, and I must say my respect for him continues to grow even to this day. As you heard, I'm going to take you on a voyage through the heliosphere using the Voyager 1 and 2 data. And I'm going to try to show you how Parker's predictions uh, were verified by Voyager in many cases. <clears throat> 
And I'll also show you uh, a number of situations in which we saw results in what Parker called the unexpected uh, category, an unobvious category. So let's begin this voyage. Uh, I'll start with Parker's book because he made his predictions uh, in the 50s and so on and gathered them together in a book called Interplanetary Dynamical Processes, which was uh, published in 1963, before we had any real extensive measurements of the solar wind. And as his stated purpose in this book is to illustrate the underlying physical principles and also the gross features of the interplanetary plasmas and magnetic fields. But being a theorist, he also understood that observations are important. In fact, he said most of the future advances of the actual as opposed to the idealized interplanetary models belong to this unobvious category of developments that he defined. I'm going to elaborate a little bit on what you just heard about Parker's spiral. Uh, of course, most of you, or all of you, should know that Parker is famous for predicting the supersonic solar wind which moves radially away from the sun and uh, carries the solar magnetic field along with it. The solar magnetic field lines are rooted in the sun and the sun is rotating. So the uh, net shape of the magnetic field lines is the spirals that you see here. And we call these the Parker spiral magnetic field lines. Okay. So the uh, rotation of the sun and the net radial motion of the solar wind produces the spiral field pattern that you see here. Now this was uh, published in 1958 and even at that time he predicted what you should see beyond the Earth's orbit shown in this slide, but also what you should see even out as far as the termination shock. And that's what you saw on that other slide. Uh, what I want to say is that it took 30 years for Voyager to make the measurements that we needed to test his model. He, uh, you can see each square on this figure represents a year of observations from Voyager 1. And they extend from 1 AU all the way out to uh, nearly 90 AU at the termination shock. Parker's curve, as you heard, is plotted on top of this. And you can see there's excellent agreement between the observations and the theory. So after 50 years, we were able to say Parker was right. Now Parker considered some basic flows that you might expect to see in the solar wind. And one of these is the co-rotating stream, which produces a co-rotating interaction region. The idea is that from some location on the sun, which is, say, anchored in the sun, we know now that that would be a coronal hole. There's a fast stream emitted, which moves and collides with a slower flow ahead of it. It also rotates with the sun because these are basically stationary streams. The collision produces a, a, a squeezing of the field lines and therefore an enhancement of the magnetic field strength. And this results in a region of strong pressure. And uh, that's what we call the co-rotating interaction region. These co-rotating interaction regions are typically observed during the declining phase of the solar cycle. And there's typically two of these per solar rotation at one astronomical unit. Now Voyager 1 observed these co-rotating interaction regions around 15 astronomical units. I'm plotting the magnitude of the field normalized as a function of time uh, for a period of year, which would be typical of my plots. And you can see that the fluctuations are periodic. The period is actually 26 days. The amplitude you see is very large, and it's also variable from one solar rotation to the next. Now, this was during the declining phase. During the next the declining phase of the solar cycle, Voyager was at nearly 55 astronomical units. And in this case, the periodicity was not observed. Instead, the fluctuations were very irregular and the amplitude was somewhat smaller than we had seen previously. So it appears that there's a transformation in the structure of the solar wind uh, during these declining phase of the solar cycle from an ordered 
quasi-periodic structure to a more random structure at larger distances from the sun. Now, in order to try to understand this, I collaborated with Chi Wang. He had a one-dimensional MHD model, time-dependent. It included pickup protons. It's simple, one-dimensional, but it was adequate to describe the kind of physics that we were interested in because we're talking about collisions. The sun is moving, I mean, the solar wind is moving radially, so the collisions are basically one-dimensional. So we used that model, but we also used the boundary conditions at 1 AU from the imp, uh, or ACE, and wind spacecraft. And the result for the prediction at 15 AU is at this top left curve. Again, you see the prediction is a periodic signal with a period of 26 days, large amplitudes, variable from one solar rotation to the next, pretty much in qualitative agreement with what we observed by Voyager 1 at 15 AU. The same model predicts at 55 AU a lack of periodicity, uh, smaller amplitude, irregular fluctuations through the course of the year, much again like what you saw in Voyager at that distance during the declining phase of the solar cycle. So qualitatively, this simple model seems to describe the observations that we made at a few points, the ground truth observations. So we can use this model to describe how the solar wind would vary as a function of distance from the sun. Here I'm showing the magnetic field strength for about half of a year for clarity. These are the observations made at 1 AU by the wind spacecraft. And the, the peaks that you see are basically the interaction regions, the co-rotating interaction regions that I showed in the slide from Parker's book. The interesting thing is that as you move from 1 to 5 AU, the interaction regions grow in height and width, and they begin to merge with one another to form merged interaction regions, much larger structure, and the period tends to double. Between 5 AU and 10 AU, the merged interactions merge again to form still larger structures. And between 15 AU and 20 AU, you see further evidence of merging. And beyond that, beyond 25 or 30 astronomical unit, the character changes completely. We lose the periodicity and we get a very irregular disturbed pattern, basically what you saw in the Voyager observations. That disturbed pattern continues all the way out to 90 AU in this simulation where the termination shock is located. And that means that uh, even during the declining phase, you would not expect to see these periodicity of 26 days at the termination shock or in the heliosheath, at least in the e ecliptic plane, which is where this model applies. This is just the cartoon uh, to give you a picture of what I've been saying. Near the sun, the uh, Co-rotating interaction regions and co-rotating streams form this spiral pattern. They tend to merge, interact, and form larger merged interaction regions. In fact, they tend to be bounded by a forward and a reverse shock. Still farther out towards 20 AU, they merge again to form larger structures. And then there's a transition, kind of a phase transition, at around 25 astronomical unit, where the ordered, ordered pattern disappears and we see a very disordered pattern from 30 AU, as I said, all the way out to the termination shock position near 90 astronomical unit. So here's an order to disorder scenario. Now another type of basic flow that Parker considered is associated with solar activity, uh, active events on the sun, the transient ejecta, as they're called by some people. Now Parker's model this in his simple fashion, as he always does, consider just a loop of magnetic fields at the sun. Now, at the time he was doing this work, there were two ideas about the nature of the magnetic fields in these loops. On the one hand, there were people who said that the field is ordered and more or less in a plane parallel to the line that you see here. The other group of people said, no, it's disordered, very turbulent, if you like. Uh, Parker didn't worry about those distinctions. He just said, let's start with a loop. Let's make it go fast, in fact, supersonic relative to the solar wind. And he showed that it would drive a blast wave or shock wave, which would be seen at Earth. And in fact, of course, these uh, things are seen 
Now, when Voyager was at about 1.6 astronomical units, we were in a fortunate configuration where we also had data from Helios 1 and 2 inside the Earth's orbit and data from the Earth orbiting spacecraft as well. So we were able to reconstruct the configuration of this magnetic loop, uh, at least in this one particular instance. And the geometry looked something like this. As I said, the spacecraft were scattered about so we could get a good feeling for the geometry. And indeed, there's a, a line on the axis which corresponds to that loop in Parker's curve in that previous slide. But the field lines adjacent to the axis of this loop did not lie in a plane like the uh, magnetic tongue model that I discussed, and they were not turbulent. And in fact, they spiraled around the axis. And there was a set of nested spirals corresponding to a force-free constant alpha force-free configuration that you expect for uh, an equilibrium system, or at least a quasi-equilibrium system. At the time I drew this in 81 or so, we, we didn't know whether the field lines were connected to the sun or even how this cloud develops, and I would say we still really don't know. But anyway, we, we found this pattern. It differed from the previous one, so we gave it a new name, called it a magnetic cloud. About a third of the ejecta that you see in the solar wind are magnetic clouds. The other third, two-thirds are what I call complex ejecta, for obvious reasons. The magnetic field, if you look at the time series, is always very complicated. We don't know how to picture it in three dimensions because we really don't have good models of these complex ejecta. So I'd pick this picture, which is really a protein molecule, because it tends to describe what I, 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 how I imagine a magnetic field to look like in the complex ejecta. But it's, there's a little bit of a serious side to this as well, because protein molecules are studied very extensively. And there's a mathematics for how these things interact and, and uh, organize themselves. And one might be able to apply that mathematics to describe at least the ejecta and the solar wind. Now, given these basic flows, Parker, and again in his book, 63, said that the many features that we just discussed interact with themselves, with each other, in ways that are too complicated to deduce from theory, at least analytical theory. And again, he said, observations of conditions in space will form the basis for progress in discovering the detailed configurations of the field in the plasma, in the, in the plasma motions in space. So I'm going to show you some examples of interactions in the next few slides. Here's a case where we had Voyager observations, again, near one and a half astronomical units. And these are the Helios 1 and Helios 2 spacecraft, and there is the Earth. So we had observations from all of these spacecraft, and just from the observations, we kind of inferred this configuration uh, for the magnetic fields and uh, basic structures. The one structure that you see here, the spiral, is the co-rotating interaction region, as I illustrated from a slide in Parker's book. The other flow here is this magnetic loop driving a shock which was another uh, illustration from Parker's book. Now the two are interacting with one another, and the strong magnetic fields in this co-rotating interaction region are interacting and merging with the strong magnetic fields behind the shock. And farther out, we would expect that they also would merge with the strong magnetic fields in this magnetic loop or ejecta. We never could agree on a term. Some people said piston. Here's a situation where, part, where Voyager was at six astronomical units, and it observed a very long-lasting, nearly a solar rotation and relatively simple stream. But the Helios observations at 0.588U, and this is 1979, showed there were really five streams uh, to be considered. Two of these were co-rotating, B and C, and the other two, more darkly shaded A, D, and E, were transient ejecta. And I noticed that stream E was moving at almost 1,300 kilometers per second, extremely fast, almost record high speeds. And stream D was moving at over 1,000 kilometers per second. So you can see what's happening. Stream D is over, E is overtaking stream D, 
That's overtaping stream C altogether. They're colliding with stream B, which is merging with stream A, and they all come together to form this nice, smooth structure that was observed by Voyager. Uh, interesting point here is that it's possible to take these observations and predict what you would see at Voyager, but you obviously cannot go backwards uh, given the Voyager observations and reconstruct what we see near one astronomical unit. This merging process is irreversible, and irreversibility is a fundamental property of the solar wind, and that's an important point. We saw another situation like this, a solar roots, uh, well, sometime later, this is 1979, in the year 2000, there were a series of events on the sun, the Bastille Day events that most of you probably know about. And they too produced a series of fast streams. And uh, we could see how those evolved out to Voyager, which was uh, near 60 a astronomical units, Voyager 2 at that time. It took six months to get there. The streams had merged to form this relatively simple profile and the magnetic field interaction regions, shocks, and so on, had emerged again by, 20, by this distance of 63 AU to form a single relatively large merged interaction region passing in about 15 days or 20 days or so. So you can see again that you have an irreversible process going on where uh, you can no longer reconstruct the configurations at one AU from observations far from the sun. Now on a still larger scale, these merging processes take place. And here I'm going to illustrate a scenario. The scale is 50 AU. I start with a Parker spiral field and maybe some co-rotating streams. And then I introduce some activity on the sun. We start injecting shock waves, magnetic clouds, complex ejecta, whatever you, CMEs, ICMEs, whatever you want to call it. So you start introducing the very complicated, strong, disturbed magnetic fields. This continues now for two or three or four solar rotations, and then the re sun returns to a quiet state. You end up with a shell of very disturbed magnetic fields, and this shell expands and moves through the heliosphere. Now this idea of a disturbed shell of magnetic fields was introduced uh, in the 50s, I'm sure. And the idea was to try to explain why the cosmic ray intensity tended to decrease near solar maximum. And they attributed it to the disturbed magnetic fields in these shells. But the mag these shells were never observed until uh, Voyager saw them. And uh, so they were really discovered by Voyager and we gave them the name Global Merged Interaction Regions for obvious reasons. Here's an example at the bottom of a global interaction region. We call them GEMERS. You see the strong magnetic fields. They're highly variable, and it persists for a, a few solar rotations. Now, again, we tried to model this using that simple one-dimensional, time-dependent MHD model of uh, Qi Wang using, uh, in this case, I think it was the ACE observations as input. And the model did indeed predict a broad region of enhanced magnetic field at approximately the time that Voyager observed this GEMER. So again, this simple model seems to be uh, valid, at least qualitatively, so we can use it to find out how the magnetic field evolves through the heliosphere. Uh, each of these panels represents the magnetic field strength as a function of time for a period of one year. These are the one astronomical unit that we input from ACE in 1999. And each of these peaks is an interaction region or ejecta or shock or something of that sort. Now, already by 5 AU, you can see that a change has taken place. The interaction regions have grown uh, in amplitude and width. They've merged and they formed merged interaction regions. At 10 A astronomical units, the model predicts that there's some clustering going on between these merged interaction regions. And by 15 astronomical units, you see a structure beginning to form, which is the GEMER. This GEMER grows from 20 AU, 30, 40, 
out to 50 AU and even 60 AU. And then it begins to decay as we move to 90 AU near the termination shock. So here's a case where we're starting with disorder and we're, con we're constructing an ordered structure which grows and then decays. Now, in this case, this profile actually indicates some remnant of the gemer, so you would expect that it would cross through the termination shock and enter the heliosheath and modify the structure of the heliosheath. Of course, we haven't seen that happen yet. Now, this figure um, introduces a, a problem. On the one hand, we can describe the gross figure features that Parker talked about, the G-MERS, uh, the co-rotating merge interaction regions. We can show how they decay and so on on an overall scale, but we can't predict the details of these fluctuations. And the reason mainly is because we don't know the boundary conditions. We can only measure boundary conditions at a point. So the question is, how do you describe the fluctuations on these large scale? I'm not talking about turbulence. I'm talking about fluctuations on a scale of a year. And I argued a long time ago that you need a statistical theory to do this because the observations uh, couldn't be modeled. And there are two statistical approaches that you might take. Some people would prefer to start with a statistical equation like a Volcker-Planck equation and then show how the distributions evolve. I don't like that approach as much because uh, the MHD models are deterministic models and they tell us exactly what's going on in terms of the physics. So I'm trying to use deterministic models to describe fluctuations. Now the way we get the fluctuations from a deterministic model is from the boundary conditions. Remember I'm using a year's worth of data and so the uh, ACE spacecraft or wind spacecraft is getting a sample of maybe a dozen solar rotations. So we get a sample of the fluctuations that are occurring near the sun on that scale. And these then interact in various ways through these MHD models and uh, nonlinear interactions produce still further complications. So we can reproduce time series as I've just shown you here. Now we can take the time series from the deterministic model and the boundary conditions that includes some statistics. We can compute the statistics for this time series. We can do the same thing for the observations at that distance and compare those statistical distributions and then test the theory in this way. Now the question is uh, what statistical functions should you compute? Now the solar wind is not a gas that's in equilibrium in a box. So Boltzmann-Gibbs statistical mechanics is probably not the thing to use. Instead, the solar wind is a highly nonlinear, open and driven system. And you need a different kind of statistical mechanics to describe that. Fortunately, uh, in 1988, Salas introduced what he called non-extensive statistical mechanics, which seems to be applicable to the solar wind. Now, obviously, I don't have time to describe all of that, but I want to make the point that this uh, theory predicts three different types of functions that are uh, particularly significant and that we should look for. By maximizing the, ex the entropy, they get a function which is called a Q-Gaussian or a Silas distribution. Now, taking a time series such as I showed in the previous slide, I can take running differences and then I collect all those running differences at, say, one day lag and I can calculate a distribution function such as the one you see here. And I can do that for different lags and get different distribution functions all the way up to scales of 127 days. Those are the plus signs that you see in these figures. The curves are fits of those distributions to the Q Gaussian distribution. So the Q Gaussian distribution does, that comes from the statistical mechanics does describe the behavior of the fluctuations of the magnetic field on scales from one day to 128 days, and this is Voyager data from 2002. Similarly, the solar wind has a multifractal structure, and again, I can't really 
tell you what that is, but you all know what it is. If you're driving on, a, if you're flying on an airplane and you run into a patch of really heavy turbulence, you get shaken up pretty well. And so you're actually feeling the multifractal structure of the air that's around you. And the same is always the case in the solar wind. Uh, here again, we have Voyager observations uh, as the dots. You describe the multifractal structure in various ways, but one of them is with this uh, multifractal spectrum. It's just a smooth curve, and I can't explain how to derive that. This, the point simply is that the Voyager observations at these large distances do tend to follow along the kind of a curve that you predict for the multifractal spectrum in, in extensive statistical mechanics. And then there's a third type of function, the usual correlation function. Now, in Bolson and Gibbs, uh, statistical mechanics correlation function as a function of scale is typically an exponential. But in this uh, statistical mechanics, it's always a power law. And indeed, the Voyager 1 observations in the distant heliosphere do show power law distributions for the correlation function. And we find these patterns at all distances and at all scales from one day to uh, 100 or 200 days. Uh, we even see them in the helio sheath, uh, and we see them on smaller scales. So this kind of statistical mechanics seems relevant, even if it's not entirely correct. It's a subject for future research. Now I'll change the uh, subject and talk about the interaction of the solar wind with the interstellar medium. Until this year, we've been using this conventional paradigm where here you see the Voyager moving through the planetary system out to the edge of this blue region, which is the termination shock. Voyager 2 is going southward, and it too has just crossed the termination shock, and both Voyager 1 and 2 are now in this region called the helio sheath, and they're moving through the helio sheath toward the boundary, uh, which is called the helio pause, which is the boundary between the solar material and the interstellar material. So that's the uh, standard picture. Uh, let me first talk about the termination shock. Voyager 1 crossed the termination shock in 2004. Unfortunately, the, we didn't get any real data because of a gap in the tracking, so we didn't see the shock itself. But you can see that prior to the termination shock, this is 2004. 4.8, 2005.2. Prior to the termination shock, you see the very low interplanetary magnetic fields. And then the, the field strength increased across the shock to about a tenth of a nanotesla. Now, it was a bit of a surprise, actually. Uh, the early theories predicted that the jump would be much larger, uh, even a factor of four, but uh, it was realized even before these observations were made that pickup protons are important. And these are produced, of course, by neutral atoms coming into the heliosphere and uh, ionizing. So the termination shock was weaker than the earlier models predicted, but uh, they produced these uh, strong magnetic fields in the helio sheath. Notice how variable the magnetic field is in the helio sheath. Variability of the magnetic field strength is almost the defining property of the magnetic uh, fields in the helio sheath. Now, Voyager 2 crossed the termination shock uh, in, uh, in 2007. This time we got lucky. We crossed it five times, and we actually saw three of those crossings. This is the simplest crossing. I'm showing some hours of data here. This is the magnetic field strength starting in the solar wind. As we approach the shock, we see the foot where the field increases. Then we approach the ramp where the field jumps to relatively large values in a very short time. Then there's an overshoot and an undershoot, and then it comes to an equilibrium level. The same sort of thing happens with the bulk speed, which drops across the foot, and then drops again as we cross the ramp, and then approaches some more uniform values. And finally, look at the directions here. There's very little change in the direction across this shock. So it's a classical quasi-perpendicular shock. And that was really what was expected, a simple quasi-perpendicular shock, because the field is normal to the shock. This is just a schematic of what I just showed. Here's the Voyager 2 
approaching the termination shock. These are the interplanetary fields. It increases as we get to the foot. It jumps further as we go through the ramp where presumably most of the dissipation takes place. And then there's this overshoot and we settle down to relatively strong values compared to the uh, values upstream. I also show a ripple here. Remember, I said we crossed the termination shock five times. Now, how can you do that? One way is to simply have ripples propagating on the surface of the shock. And uh, that's what's illustrated here. Now, we saw three of the crossings, as I mentioned. The one I just described is this crossing from the solar wind to the helio sheath. A little later, a few hours later, we crossed back from the helio sheath into the solar wind. Now, notice here the foot is not so well developed as it was in the previous shock, and the structure behind the shock is also different. The shock seems to be uh, changing significantly from the perpendicular shock that we saw earlier. And the third shock, which was actually here, from the helio sheath to the solar wind, was not a shock at all as far as the magnetic field is concerned. Uh, but there was a change in the speed from low to very high values indicated that we did go from the helio sheath to the solar wind. So the picture that we have is that this termination shock is not at all stationary. It forms, it decays, uh, it disappears, and then it reforms again. And this is all happening on a matter of several hours. So the termination shock is very dynamic. Now looking at a larger scale inside the helio sheath, I'm showing you some Voyager 2 observations. Uh, this is from 2007. Here's the solar wind again. We cross the termination shock at this point, and then for 40 days behind the termination shock, you saw these very large oscillations in the hour averages. In fact, the oscillations were very large even at the finer time scale as indicated by the fluctuations in the 48 second averages. So th behind the shock, the turbulence, if that's what you can call it, was very highly compressible, very much unlike the turbulence that we see in the solar wind near one astronomical unit. And then a little farther behind the shock, we uh, saw another 40 or 60 days in which the field was highly variable, but a little more coherent. On the largest scales that we could study up to date, we have Voyager 1 data. I'll just discuss the magnetic field. Uh, from 2006, just after the termination shock crossing, to 2008.8. Now, what did we expect to see? Well, we're moving into the helio sheath toward the heliopause. The models in the literature, which are stationary models, predicted that the field should increase. And in fact, the field, if you do a linear least squares fit through these large fluctuations, was actually decreasing. So how is it possible for the magnetic field strength to be decreasing as we move deeper into the helio sheath? Well, the answer is in this, uh, comes back to Parker again, and this unusual solar cycle. These are the data that I showed earlier verifying Parker's model. Now that we know it works, we can apply it and predict what would be observed if there were no shock out to 120 AU or so, to 115 AU. And because this last solar cycle was so unusual, the magnetic field at 1 AU uh, dropped to about 4 nanoteslas, which is the record low for an annual value, and uh, therefore is this decrease is largely a result of time dependence, of a solar cycle dependence. So given that, you have to correct the Voyager observations in order to compare with uh, these models which were stationary. When you do that, you find that the field actually does increase with distance inside the helio sheath. And this distance increase was offset by the temporal decrease to give us the constant values that we observed. Now, one other thing Parker talked about in his book is the heliopause itself. This, again, is 1963. In his usual style, he wanted to understand the physics, so he considered the simple situations, in fact, two of them. First, he said, let's 
ignore the interstellar magnetic field and just consider the motion of the heliosphere through the interstellar medium, and he produced what, we, what looks like the standard paradigm that I showed you a little while ago with a bullet-shaped uh, heliopause, which is open at one end. Then he took the case where you had no motion but very strong interstellar magnetic fields. In this case, here's the termination shock now for several examples of the interstellar pressure, which was not known then and isn't known now. And he calculated the shape of the heliopause that you see here, again, for different pressures. Now it's quite different, and you see it's open at both ends. So which of these is correct? Well, you heard a lot probably about the IBEX observations, and uh, they observed the bright band of energetic neutral particles, which are projected here onto the heliopause. This was not expected. Nobody really understands it yet, and there's no consensus. But most people would agree that both of these effects described by Parker are important. On the one hand, the motion is important, producing this blunt bullet-shaped nose. And on the other hand, the magnetic field lines in the interstellar medium are draping around it, tending to squeeze it and distort the shape that way. I might also point that the interplanetary, I mean the interstellar, I should say, inter magnetic field lines are pressing up against the heliopause from the bottom, distorting it still further. So both of Parker's uh, illustrative calculations are relevant. We don't fully understand all of this, but uh, hopefully in the next few years we'll understand it better. Notice that Voyager 1 and Voyager 2 are shown here, uh, now projected actually out to the heliopause, which is the surface that you see here. This is my final slide, uh, which both summarizes my talk and illustrates some of the challenges that are ahead. I've taken you with, on this voyage from one astronomical unit to the solar wind and Parker's spiral magnetic field to the uh, dynamic ripple termination shock and into this helio sheath. Voyager 1 is now moving through the helio sheath into this unexplored dark territory. It will cross the heliopause and enter the interstellar medium. And Voyager 2 will do the same. This large figure represents the obstacles that we face in the years ahead. Uh, in principle, we can complete this voyage, but we cannot do it without the help of all of you. I mean scientists, the managers, the engineers, the technical people, and most of all, the American people. Thank you very much. We have time for questions, so if I can see a hand go up in these bright lights, I'd love to get that question from you. Anyone? Okay. Hi, I'm, I'm a project scientist for the Helios Variable Images on Stereo. And we can see these emergent fractures, uh, sorry, these ferroidentity fracturing forming in our images. We can actually see them happening now. What can we do to add to this picture? What, what should we be studying? Well, for example, these interactions between the magnetic clouds and the co-rotating stream is something that we kind of imagined, we reconstructed from the time series. In your data, you can actually see this happening. You can see the interaction by the density enhancements. And basically, there's a paper coming out which verifies this picture that I showed in an earlier slide. So yes, you can follow the actual development beautifully. Any other question? A shout out if uh, you have your hand up. Yes. One thing that always has confused me about this is, is how will we really know when we cross the, the actual heliopod boundary? It seems to be less defined than the round shot and the termination shot. And, and what is Voyager going to cross it? Well, <laughs> The, I showed you that picture of the heliopause in this slide here. We don't know the size of the heliopause. We don't know its shape, and we don't know its structure. So we really don't know when we're going to cross it. 
the hope is that we will cross it before 2020 when uh, we run out of gas in uh, Voyager, and we expect that we will. And now as to how we will recognize it, uh, we have to play that by ear, as that was the case in the termination shock. We really didn't know how we were going to identify when we crossed the termination shock, uh, especially on Voyager 1 where we didn't have the plasma observations. But it should be pretty obvious in Voyager 2 if we have the plasma observations. And I'm sure there'll be a number of signatures that'll be quite distinct from the Helios sheath. Yes. I'm, the source of the painting. Well, okay. This is a petroglyph. And uh, there are various ideas as to what the source really is. Uh, on the one hand, it's traditionally said that the, this was run by the American Indians. And uh, then again, there are those people, of course, who say that when the aliens came through to the earth, they had to pass through this region, and they wanted to record what they saw as well as give us some knowledge of themselves. I uh, wouldn't take that too seriously. And then there's the third possibility. You know, Parker and his wife loved to hike in, uh, in the desert in the southwest, <laughs> and maybe he drew this picture. Thank you very much for your attention, and I would like to take this moment to uh, give Le Dr. Len Berlaga a, a certificate of SPA and AGU appreciation for his fine lecture, and I invite you to congratulate him as well. Thank you. Again, let me remind you of the continuation of this subject in the session next door, so I invite you to go. Thank you. <laughs>